Wow. Um, so as, as big as our market is, 52 million people, you know, those with, with real access to the internet and making use of it beyond mobile is, is really limited. So, so this has limitations on, on what kind of environment we're playing in. Um, you know, it's a, it's a real split, geographically speaking. South Africa is made up of three major cities and, and a number of others, but um, that being Cape Town, Johannesburg, and, and Durban. We're seeing most of the activity happen within Cape Town. About 33% of that takes place in Cape Town. Johannesburg following behind it at 20%. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff that, that promotes entrepreneurship, but in the same vein, um, really hinders um, the growth within the sector, and I think um, that falls on a number of things, you know, um, government regulation, um, even though South Africa is noted as one of the easiest places to start a business in an emerging economy really? compared to Brazil, Russia, India, China, all the BRICS, um, it's really easy to get it going and off the ground, but I think it's, it's what I call the point of silliness is, is taking it that one step further. Um, where, where things like labor laws are in place, protecting people from, from hire, well, hiring, fine, firing is just not as easy. And, and so it doesn't make for an easy and, and agile environment. So if we broke it down into like, what kind of things are people working on? We can say that there's about a 16% focus on telcos. There's a software at 30, 13%. E-commerce, you'd be surprised, is only making up about 3% of the, the, the activities there. Um, and the rest is really heavily weighted towards energy um, and, and particularly in health um, with a lot of others on the sides. So South Africa is actually a, a country of real extremes. You know, um, in terms of the Gini coefficient, which measures the difference between those who have wealth and, and, and can afford things versus those that are living in complete poverty, South Africa actually ranks as the highest in the world, with our Gini coefficient being at 0.64. Um, so you can imagine the, the challenges that we face in that. Coupled with that is, is a massive unbanked sector. So 67% of, of the market does not have access to you know, formal financial institution and, and, and infrastructure. So from that perspective, if we took a look at that, we'd say, well, there, there, there's opportunity within the, the startup environment um, to focus on things like mobile payments, to focus on things like e-commerce, um, and hopefully that's going to grow in, in future. Um, you know, moving on from uh, you know what you said earlier in the introduction with regards to to the likes of Elon Musk. I mean, he's South African, and he really is this poster boy yeah. for for global entrepreneurship. I mean, I don't know any entrepreneurs who don't wish they could meet him or be him. Um, so, so we're really proud of that. But but the fact of the matter is that he didn't actually achieve his success in South Africa. He he was outside of South Africa, you know, in, in, involved in PayPal. And, and so the question has to be asked, would he have achieved that same success if he had stayed in South Africa? Um, and there are a number of other case studies that, that follow suite and, and, and show the same example. Um, for, for instance, uh, Mark Shuttleworth, uh, who's one of South Africa's uh, favorite entrepreneurs as well, even though he was very successful within the South African entrepreneurship ecosystem itself, he's actually moved outside of South Africa because of the, the ease of, of growing businesses beyond the, the geographical location. Um, there, are, there are countless other examples. Human Hearness, who started up Mixit, which is one of the Africa's biggest social networking sites. It's instant messaging on a very, very low data consumption. Um, he's been incredibly successful, had a great buyout, um, selling it on to World of Avatar, who's, who's scooping up companies all over Africa. Um, and then, of course, Ronnie Aptiecker is another entrepreneur who started Internet Solutions, which is the biggest internet service provider in Africa. Um, and you know, he, he, he did find this local success, um, but really on the back of it being bought out by Dimension Data and being able to scale it beyond a small startup into something that's, that's way bigger. Um, there, there are loads of other examples of, you know, we've got uh, second in command at Microsoft is, is a South African. Um, we've got, I think, second in command at NASA is a South African. So there's certainly not a lack of talent with, within the, the system. I think it, it's more of how do we retain that talent? Um, and, and there's actually a, this, this word known as the brain drain, um, and South Africa's really felt the pinch on that, is that we, we have great smart people coming through the system, uh, but because there isn't this hospitable, nurturing environment, they're actually moving elsewhere. So um, one of the interesting facts you'll actually be surprised to know is that in Silicon Valley, I think it was in 2013, or it might have been 2012, sorry if I, I, I'm not quite sure in the year, but they awarded uh, five top entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, and four of those five were actually South Africans wow. themselves. 
um, which is obviously great, but, but you know, why, aren't we, why aren't we getting this recognition back home? Um, and I think one of the, the main things is, is really, as I say, fostering this, 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 this culture. Um, and it really starts off with basic education. South Africa was ranked 143 out of 144 countries in the world for its education standards, particularly with regards to maths and science, which we all know is fundamental yeah. in doing what we do. Um, and I think from, from, you know, there have massive challenges. 80% of South African schools are dysfunctional. Um, they have huge challenges in the form of not having decent sanitation. <laughs> Here we go, African time, guys. Some of the South African <laughs> team joining. Um, so, so from a perspective of education, um, where the public sector is really failing, the, the problem is that we're just not breeding those entrepreneurs yeah. on a mass scale. Yeah. Um, we're breeding people who are ready to work in the corporate world and certainly ready to work in unskilled labor fields. So from that perspective, there's an abundance, um, but certainly from an entrepreneurship perspective, there, there isn't at this point in time. Um, just looking at tertiary education, obviously given the, the, the basic education being so poor where you know, there's only one in 12 chance, one in 12 chance of a, a six-year-old actually getting a, a, a basic education qualification, so to speak, um, you know, the enrollment into tertiary education is, is really low. Uh, those that go into it, of course, they're, they're talented and they're great, but, but the, the pool of, of, of talent that we're tapping into is really small. Um, but saying that, we've got some of the best universities in the world. UCT, the University of Cape Town, the best university in, in, in Africa, is ranked somewhere around 50 in the world. So, so it's not short on, on those expertise once they are there, just the small market. Um, we've also got other, other environments and universities specifically. There's the Cape University Technicon, there's the University of the Western Cape, and there's Stellenbosch. And uh, these are four big universities that are all based in the Western Cape. So, and this is probably why we're seeing that geographic weighting towards the, the Cape area. Um, but saying that, there is the University of Johannesburg and, and WITS, Witwatersrand um, University, which are both based up in Johannesburg. Geographically, they're quite close together. And from this, we're actually seeing, just as we are in Cape Town, how incubation hubs are forming around these establishments. Um, we've got uh, the MIH uh, incubation hub, which is based in Stellenbosch, and we're seeing great stuff come out of that. We've got Bandwidth Barn, which is a, a really a well-known, um, you know, globally recognized incubation hub, which supports around 150 companies um, at the moment, which, which is really great. And, and a lot of case studies have been done on that. Um, from, from moving on from the tertiary education sector, it's really about how do we, we foster these incubation hubs and, and how do we start accelerating programs. And there isn't a lack in that either. You know, we've, uh, one, one thing I failed to mention was the African Leadership Academy, which actually goes and scouts talent from across the continent, from as young as 15 years old, and they bring them through to, to Johannesburg. There's an African Leadership Academy where they, they foster this entrepreneurial spirit at a young age. So 15-year-olds do a two-year program, um, and they're working very closely with mentors, with, with successful entrepreneurs, uh, and getting a real feel for the environment. So I think these, you know, it hasn't been going for, for that long, um, but it's starting to, to pull a bit of traction, which is great. It really is. I think one of the big things around um, education in Africa is that it, it just doesn't foster that, that entrepreneurship, as I mentioned before. Um, and luckily, we're starting to see that change. So uh, the, the industry itself is, is very vibrant, especially in Cape Town. We have a number of conferences um, that take place to support this. There's a Net Profit, which is a free conference. It's offered to over a 1,000 people and top quality speakers from around the country, but also internationally. There's also Tech for Africa, which has been going for about five, six years now. Um, and that as well, it attracts huge names. Uh, Google presented there last year. We've got some amazing skill from across the continent to, you know, they're all, they're all coming in to present there too. And, and they, they've actually started creating these conferences, sort of breakout conferences in the likes of Nairobi um, and looking at Ghana as well. So I'm going to invite uh, Aki and Arthur on stage to join us because yeah. I'm sure they have loads to add to what I've been yeah. saying. But just even speaking with you, there's just so many similarities between even the Barcelona ecosystem and what you're mentioning in Cape Town and South Africa. For sure. Kind of having this access to great talent and great universities, um, you know, but 
but also having to play that balance without losing this talent to, to other uh, ecosystems and other places in the world. I, I think you hit the nail on the head there, really. It's, uh, you know, as much as this talent that comes through, and I, I say it's a small pool, but there is talent coming through, they're getting picked up by corporates. Yeah. They're getting headhunted by Silicon Valley. I mean, the, the, the network in Silicon Valley of South Africans is pretty immense. Um, so, so it's really the, the question, you know, us in, in cultivating this environment is how do we retain that talent? Yeah. Um, perhaps you guys have more to say on that um, yeah. around actually holding our talent. And, and you've seen how we've lost some of our, our amazing golden boys um, to bigger companies, to, to better environments. Um, what do you think is, is something that we can do to change that? Well, it's a, it's a little bit like what happened to Aki and myself uh, now. People get lost in the system. And uh, apologies for <laughs> our late arrival uh, here today. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's not just a joke. Um, there's no real support structure for talent of that kind in South Africa. So you find a lot of people who are, for example, great uh, app developers. They try putting an app out there. They might get little recognition. And then nothing further happens. Or they go, and work, they go to work for a big development house, um, for example, and they get sucked into that system where the stars are the marketing people, not the uh, developers, for example. So the, the techie doesn't really have any natural channel for themselves becoming star developers mm -hmm. or known names in the industry. But I also think that uh, w what is happening, you know, that might have been the story, say, 18 months ago. But you're actually starting to see a reversal of this happening right now, where you have these tech hubs that are being developed in the likes of Kenya. There's Stellenbosch, uh, parts of Cape Town, even Johannesburg. And, um, you, you know, the, the, the people who are establishing these kind of hubs are realizing now that there is massive value in what they are developing for Africa specifically. So you're seeing this incredible amount of investment coming in, foreign investment, that's you know, lifting up the, you know, the rate of pay and what, what the value of these people are to these kind of startups and, and, and these, these, um, these setups that they have in the likes of Kenya. And you are starting to see a lot of the talent being retained, and in some cases, some talent even coming back. Yeah and networking with international talent. So it is a, there's a mushrooming of fantastic uh, hubs that are coming out all over Africa. And I think that, you know, if we look back where Africa was five years ago, you know, we were literally a hamstrung continent. We didn't have uh, international connectivity until this West Africa cable system arrived on the west coast of Africa. And you have countries like Mali. I was talking to these guys from Mali. I mean, you can imagine a country that didn't have its own internet access. The, the incredible impact that a high-speed internet broadband access has had to a country like Mali, a country like Namibia, you are seeing all of these entrepreneurs mushrooming up all over the place, coming in with incredible energy, re-energizing economies, and that's what it's all about. Completely, and, and I think what Aki says is that there is just this mushrooming, and, and what's so exciting is that it's Africans solving African problems. You know, exactly. Africa is massive, there are a billion people on the continent. Um, and so while the South African sector, I think, is quite small, you know, we can look northwards and, and there is this huge opportunity to really tap into those untapped. Um, and so I think it's a very exciting place to be at the moment. And, and it is just about fine tuning. And as you say, over these last 18 months, fine tuning those, um, those programs that they're putting out. Um, and from that, you know, we start seeing more angel investment taking place. And then that escalates into more sort of VC mm. taking place. And then going on to the private equity and, and buyouts as well. Sure. So it, it has to start somewhere. And, and we're lucky that it, it has started, which is great. Mm. And maybe but that's, maybe that's the, the, the gateway, right? The, the gateway to the rest of Africa is the emerging economies, the emerging yeah. ecosystems uh, come into their own. You know, South Africa having the head start of the continent can kind of facilitate that growth and, and channel that. Yeah, what happens next is uh, really the most exciting part of all because right now in South Africa we have about 40 million cell phone users of which about uh, 15 million are smartphones. Now, if you looked three years ago at, at the numbers, uh, the number of cell phone users was a little lower, maybe 36 million. But the number of smartphone users was less than half of that. So in a very, very short time, it suddenly doubled. And the growth that we're seeing now of, of new smartphone users is something like uh, three or four million a year adding to it. So four years from now, to take the theme of uh, the <laughs> conference, uh, you're looking at um, half of the population, never mind half the cell phone users, half the population 
using smartphones in South Africa. When you have that kind of tipping point, then you can imagine the demand for local apps and the demand for people who can develop those uh, local apps. So we expect innovation to mushroom in South Africa in the next yeah. four years. And uh, that obviously will have a knock-on effect through the rest of Africa. So I think if we, if we take the next five years, it's going to be a very exciting time in tech um, of all kinds, but starting with mobile across Africa. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Arthur. I mean, the, the story of Africa is, is amazing. You know, we are both born in Africa, born and bred in Johannesburg, traveled in Africa, and it is just the most exciting continent to be in right now where this incredible innovation is happening. And you consider that 60% of Africans don't have electricity. You know, that's the most astounding figure. You don't have electricity, so how do you charge your mobile device? How do you compute? So, uh, solar, for example, the innovation that's taking place around solar, the innovation that's taking place, like a company like Amazon in Nigeria, in Lagos, how do you deliver your products to different areas? They've gone there, they failed, they can't get it right, but they are innovators that are using different forms of technology to get their products around different kinds of delivery services. So you're seeing all of these explosions that are happening in this space, and for me, the, one of the most exciting spaces that's coming through is the medical field, where you have people in completely remote areas. How do you get doctors? How do you get doctors, give doctors access to those people? You're going to do it through mobile telephony. And the kinds of technologies that are coming out that you're able to diagnose people um, from a medical point of view and an educational point of view, to teach people education and to diagnose people thousands of kilometers away from the nearest hospital. That is seriously powerful, and that's mobile technology that's facilitating that. I, I think the reason is, I mean, because it's mobile-based, you know, the, the rest of the world is, has sort of gone through the whole journey, whereas Africa, we have kind of leapfrogged them. Yeah. Um, so you'd almost say in some contexts, we're actually slightly more advanced um, from a mobile perspective, I would say. Um, in, in different ways, you know, we obviously have to be very concerned about our, and, and conservative about data consumption, given the, the high price um, of data. I mean, South Africa is the most expensive, Aki, uh, Arthur, I think South Africa is the most expensive in the world, isn't at it, the, with regards the to data? At the, at the most expensive rate, we are amongst the most expensive in the world, not yeah. the most expensive, but we incredibly expensive. If you, this is the irony of uh, South Africa especially, if you're wealthy, you can afford to buy large data bundles and uh, large contracts which bring the cost of data per megabyte down to a few cents, a few South African cents, a fraction of an American cent. But if you're poor and you have to pay as you go and, uh, and it comes off your airtime, the cost of data is the equivalent, um, I'm not sure in, in dollar 30, terms. It's about uh, 20 cents a euro, two rand a meg, yeah. more or less. Two rand, two rand a meg in South Africa is incredibly expensive and the, the poor can't afford that. They have a limited budget to spend on their phone and they cannot allocate any of that budget to data. So at the moment, the, uh, the, the, lower, so the lower socioeconomic uh, segments in South Africa simply cannot afford to use data. Whereas for the wealthy, it's incredibly cheap. And that's a massive dichotomy in South Africa. It's, a, it's a, an irony and it's a contradiction. Uh, the poorer you are, the more you pay uh, for access. And that has to change. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I hope that South Africa can take, can take lessons from our, our northerly countries, you know, the, the likes of Kenya, where the government has massively subsidized uh, data bundles, and they're actually doing a really big push towards the driving smartphone adoption. Um, so I, I, I believe they don't even sell feature phones in Kenya anymore. Um, and you, you're going to see the impact that that has on the economy, and, and it's something that South Africa perhaps is on a back foot with, where we're not having the support from government in that, in that frame of mind. Um, but again, we're starting to see the change. We are starting to see a bit of a price war come through with the data. Um, but as, uh, as Arthur says, it's incredibly expensive for the poor, where they're spending upwards of 30% of their annual or well, their monthly salaries is going towards data, just to be connected, just to have that information at their hands. Oh. Yeah. And, and, and uh, as Arthur said, you know, I mean, it, it, it's changing. I mean, this, um, governments are starting to realize the impact that technology can have on your economy. Um, and, and also, you know, we must also remember it's got a lot to do with infrastructure at the moment. Uh, we, we're very hamstrung on the African continent with regards to rollout of LTE, for example, which is still lagging a little bit behind. We're waiting for the digital migration to take place from television, which was meant to happen last year. That's going to free up a lot of spectrum. The moment you free up that spectrum, 
um, you know, you're going to free up you know, uh, the ability to have LTE. But right now, it's still very much a 3G driven continent. And you've got to design your apps and your technologies for 3G. And, and, and this is why we are so unique, is that the rest of the world is almost past 3G and is developing apps for higher speed uh, availability of information. Um, but yeah, we've certainly got uh, many challenges ahead of us. For sure. so, so what does the future look like, guys? Um, the, fu the future is definitely mobile. If you uh, look at computer penetration versus mobile penetration, you simply cannot compare. Now, right now, more than half of the people of Africa have cell phones. But the only country where there's real PC penetration is in South Africa. And even that is about, it's less than 20% of the population has ever seen a PC, let alone uh, own one. So. Uh, the, it's, it's very clear that uh, we have to um, leverage the mobile device and especially the smartphone as the computer of the future for um, South Africa and Africa. But the one really interesting thing about where it's potentially going lurks in a crisis that we have in the country at the moment, which is an educational crisis. In rural areas and outlying areas, people simply cannot get textbooks for uh, their basic school education. But there are more and more initiatives emerging now to put textbooks on phones, both from a point of view of um, uh, being able to download it off a website, but also starting to issue SIM cards with textbooks actually embedded in the SIM cards. And uh, that's obviously a far easier way of distributing textbooks than um, getting the physical books out there. But if you can get the connectivity issue sorted out, then you can, uh, in fact, deliver all textbooks via cell phone. A company that's um, behind it, excuse me, let me just switch this phone off. The company that's, that's behind one of those initiatives is uh, funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation. Mark Shuttleworth, who's the man behind Ubuntu, in fact, uh, has funded this foundation called the Siabula Foundation. And they are digitizing all high school maths and science textbooks specifically for people to be able to download it uh, onto phones and other mobile devices. So in the future, it's possible that you might not even need uh, textbooks in schools anymore. And bear in mind, this is a market that can't afford tablets. So uh, where the Western markets are talking about moving to tablets for education, we're looking at how we can move to mobile phones for education. And I think four years from now, that's going to be a, a big push in uh, non-urban areas. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm very very optimistic. When you look at the um, the growth rate that's happening, you look at the world's uh, top ten growing economies. Six of them are found in sub-Saharan Africa, and in the next uh, 24 months, that number is going to increase. So, sub-Saharan Africa is going to be the place where the world's economies are the fastest growing economies in the world are taking place. Now. I don't know about you, but there's lots of opportunity that lies there. And when you look at what um, you know, those regions have done with mobile money, for example, yeah. and you look at M-Pesa in Kenya, and you look at, um, that's just one example. I mean, there are like dozens of small entrepreneurial pockets that are finding different ways of transferring money in a system where you didn't have an established banking system and you couldn't do it. So how do you move money around using the mobile platforms? And I mean, the, the, the kind of entrepreneurial designs and thoughts that are coming from just the banking side and transferring money is just mind blowing. Yeah. You show to banks in the United States, for example, and they say, wow, is that how you guys are transferring money? Yeah. That is seriously impressive. Yeah. And that is coming from people who had no idea on how to do it before. And that's where true entrepreneurial um, energy is born. And that's why it's so exciting to be in sub-Saharan Africa right now. And just on your point around um, the financial markets, I mean, South Africa has the second most stable financial or banking system in the world yes. on the bat after, um, after Switzerland. So, you know, that in itself is a massive draw factor for, for entrepreneurs, for investors um, to have the stability. But one of the concerns is that that's just not playing through into, into the field. And again, we're seeing that change. And as I mentioned earlier, how on a microfinance level, it's, it's there, um, but it's that next step up. And we actually saw KPMG did a report, they released a port, report last year that said not one single South African rand went from local investments, local VCs, towards, um, towards local businesses. It was all foreign, 
money that had been invested in these companies. Um, so we, uh, we're starting to see that change as well. Um, Knife Capital is a, a globally recognized VC um, fund now. Um, and they're starting to, to really invest heavily in the sector. And we're starting to see other players come in. But I think from an investment point of view, there is massive opportunity there. Because the talent is there, the opportunity is there. Um, but there's just this lack of funding, which is really, really a, a thorn in the side for entrepreneurs. <laughs> um, but it, it really is an opportunity for investors. Yeah, it well, certainly is. And it's just not only just the app world. You know, I mean, you look at gaming, for example, how big gaming is. One of EA's main hubs is situated in South Africa. Uh, that's where games like Need for Speed are designed. That's where the core headquarters is. They obviously work and network with other people around the world. But the point is that there are uh, like incredible designers and people who are incredibly um, experienced in the coding of that game that are situated over there. And this is essentially what mobility allows you to do as well. You know, you're able to work from wherever you are in the world. So, you know, having a team and you know, sorting out those kind of issues and technologies is quite powerful when you have that connectivity. And this is what we're seeing starting to happen in remote parts of Africa. I think Goldman Sachs said that there's no better time to invest in Africa than right now. So exactly. Um, perhaps we leave it at there and, and we invite investors to come and, and visit the country. It's a, you'll have a great time, um, that's for sure. And, and, you know, it could be a good business decision as well. Thank you. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, guys. So. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Oh, we have a microphone from the back. No question up front. <laughs> the question, I have to admit that I know, know Barbara well, um, and I know that she's a done a phenomenal job with her company, Abami, but I'd be really interested to hear your own, all three of you, your own personal journeys about your own experiences as entrepreneurs in South Africa. Um, Sure. Well, so, so I'll keep it brief because we, we don't have much time, but um, I actually started Obami, my, the company that I run, which is an education-based company that connects um, teachers, learners, and parents to one another so that they can share and access content, they can undertake assessment, um, they can collaborate with people beyond their immediate environment, so hopefully helping this education crisis that we spoke of. Um, and we're starting to see some traction there. But I actually started in the UK, and I had a, an, an enormous amount of support there in the UK through business grants and the like. Um, but my heart is African. I had to come back and, and see what I could do in the continent. And since having moved back, um, you know, I think it's a very small market in terms of the entrepreneurs that are there, the investors that are there. It's, it, everyone knows everyone. Um, but in saying that, as small as it is, it's, it's incredibly... It's a, a real privilege to be part of it because it is such a tight network um, and everyone's out there to support one another. There's, there's a, a real sense of collaboration as well. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, as, as much as I would love to be based uh, you know, around the rest of the world and, and take advantage of some of the other infrastructure that's there, there's no better place than home. Um, and particularly when I start looking at the opportunities that we're seeing, we've got schools who are picking up the, the system that we offer in Ghana, in Kenya, in Senegal, of all places, Rwanda, um, Namibia, Mozambique. And, and I think from that perspective, you know, being in South Africa, it acts as a springing board into the rest of Africa. And that's certainly something that I've found on a personal experience. Mm. Um, you know, frustrations aside, I think there's just more opportunity than that. Um, and, and that's what we look for yeah. from a personal perspective. You guys? A little background in your own ventures? I was very lucky uh, more than 20 years ago to be working for a newspaper called The Mail and Guardian, which is known in South Africa for its investigative journalism, but it was also known for being very experimental. And they allowed me to start writing about this thing called the internet back in 1992. Oh, oh my God. That's <laughs> wow. the NSA. That's the NSA. <laughs> Don't <laughs> say anything more. Okay. I'm, I'm going to change what I was going to say about Mail and Guardian. <laughs> if the NSA is listening. But they, al they allowed us to experiment and to write about areas that there was very little interest in at the time, like the internet. In 92, there was no commercial internet. Um, only from uh, 1994 onwards, we actually have commercial internet in South Africa. Um, but through writing about it, um, it attracted the attention of a publisher who asked me to write a book about the internet in South Africa. And it was called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Internet. It came out in 1995. And what is interesting with that, when it uh, came out, it created massive interest amongst businesses wanting to know how they can use this thing. And they approached us for consulting and research services. 
and I realized there was a massive gap to research that environment and uh, started my first internet research company back in 1997. Uh, that became part of a, um, an IPO, as you call it here, we call it a listing, but it was a disastrous listing. So my first startup uh, had an IPO, which is the dream of startups today, but uh, it was so disastrous that uh, I went into debt for quite a few years. But the new company, um, Worldwide Works, which I run uh, now, started in 2000, and we made a concerted effort not to become involved in anyone else's IPO plans. And today we're probably the leading um, tech research company in Africa. So uh, it's been um, a journey of great ups and downs, but the opportunity in South Africa and across Africa for that kind of service was just massive. And I think it almost symbolizes the extent to which opportunity remains across Africa. There are so many gaps mm -hmm. in knowledge and activity that uh, anyone who wants to enter those kind of arenas has got the opportunity to. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, um, I, uh, I've been in the business for uh, just over 20 years, as Arthur has. I started in broadcasting. I still am in broadcasting at uh, a radio station called Talk Radio 702 and hosting a technology show on CNBC Africa, a TV show and a write for a few publications. But my passion is technology, and my passion is joining the dots and joining the people together. So in, in a sense, I'm a, almost like an evangelist, and when I give talks, I, I try and inspire people to think out of the box, to think laterally, to develop solutions that affect Africans for Africa. And, um, and just connecting people together and getting the best out of our system of entrepreneurs because Africa has got the most incredible entrepreneurial spirit that I've seen anywhere in the world. And that inspires me every day to join those people together using technology as the driver to improve a continent and take it to the next level. Thank you, guys. I think that's all the, the time we have for, for now. But, uh, but certainly, the, the African ecosystem is, is something to watch for because, by necessity, it's, it's going to be unorthodox in its growth. And I think uh, that's, that's where you see the, the best innovation is, is situations like that. So I want to yeah. thank you for your time and, and Barbara uh, for coming here and offering your introduction to the uh, South African entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, enjoy the rest of the week in Barcelona. Thank, thank you for having so us. Much. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank